We are all going to face God's judgment. And nothing can change that from happening. Nothing can change the plans of God. God himself has limited himself to his own word. It's going to play into this evening as we get further along. God's day is coming. God has a plan for judgment, but thank God he has a plan of salvation. And nothing can change the plan of salvation. Jesus is the only way, and he will always be the only way. God has a plan for your life. And nothing can change that plan. And what comes into play with that is we, ourselves, try to change the plan that God has for us. But his plan doesn't change. And there's often conflict between us and God because we want to try and change his plan. And if we just realize his plan is the best plan, that will benefit you and I. Thank God his plans don't change. I stopped planning things a few years ago because everything always happens when I plan things. Weather could happen. This guy, God knows everything. God is judging the people in Micah. And the day is coming. If you can't get anything from tonight's message more than this, is at the day of judgment, you cannot change God's mind. It, will, it does not happen. And we're going to see what happens here in the book of Micah, how God's dealing with the people. And again, it's his own people. If you're a parent, you need to correct your own. God's going to correct his own people. Especially if they live in your house. We talked about this last week. This is God's land. This is his purpose. He's the provider. And the people got a bright idea. We don't need God. God is going to remind them that this is my house. My rules. And if you just understood that you're benefiting because of my way. In Micah chapter 3, we're going to read verses 1 through 7. And I said here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob and ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? Judgment's coming. They know this. It's being told to them. Today in the year of grace, there's a day coming when Christ is going to return. And God doesn't surprise people. A majority of people think God wants to hide himself from us, and he doesn't. He wants to... He wants you to know him. And when he returns, it's not, it shouldn't be a surprise to Christians. But even the lost, it's been told to you. It's going to happen. Who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin from off them and their flesh from off their bones, who also eat the flesh of my people and flay their skin from off them, and they break their bones and chop them to pieces for the pot and the flesh within the cauldron. Then shall they cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He will even hide his face from them at that time, as they have behaved themselves ill in their doings. Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace, and he that putteth not into their mouths, they 
even prepare war against him. Therefore, night shall be unto you, that he shall not have a vision. And it shall be dark unto you, and he shall not divine. And the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Then shall the seers be ashamed, and the diviners confounded. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Lord, we're so thankful that you've given us your word. You've given us your son. You made a way of a plan of salvation. But also, Lord, there's a plan of judgment coming. If there's anyone this evening that does not know your son, may tonight be that night. May us get closer to you this evening. May your word go forth. And Lord, everything that's said and done may be pleasing to you in Christ's name. Amen. In this first verse, and I said here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob, a princes of the house of Israel, is not for you to know judgment. The word judgment itself means to make things right. And only God can make things right. He's the only one that can make something right in your life. More than ever this year, you've heard me emphasize over and over again, and especially to his own people. If you're saved, I don't care how long you've been saved, you cannot make the right decision without God. His own people cannot make the right decision without him. It boggles my mind sometimes how we trust God with our soul, but then we forget about him. We've included him in our salvation, but not in our lives here on earth. Judgment is justice, and God is the judge. And God is the only one that can make things right. The first time we see this term judgment, even though he did judge the people in Noah's day, that's not the first time you see judgment, the word. The first time you see the word judgment is in Genesis 18, 19, when he deals with Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says this, For I know him that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment, that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he have spoken of him. Only God can make things right. And God will make things right. And if you're a child of his, if you're <laughs> committing sin, if you're doing wrong, God is going to make things right. In our household, Fawn and I, he has given us the responsibility of two children. And if you're parents, he has given you the responsibility of making things right. And if your children do wrong, you are to correct things and make things right. And he says, and I said, when God speaks, his word is the answer. When God says and he speaks, he's given you an answer. His word is the answer. And I'm here to remind you that Jesus is the word. And I go through this because we are never to forget that Jesus is the answer. If you read your Bible, God, Jesus, when he takes the scene here on a flesh, when he revealed himself as man, I am the word. And the word was with God and of God. Jesus is the word. Therefore, Jesus is the answer. To answer, to say in one's heart, to thank, to command, to promise, to intend. That's God's word. His word is the answer. As a pastor, I get phone calls all day long. And I just feel like sometimes it's a repeat if you just open God's word. 
I'm going to tell you what scripture has to say. Majority of people don't like it. A majority of people, when they call, I kid you not, they want to hear what they're doing is right when they know that their life is a disaster. And they're telling me what they're doing, and I say, well, what does God say? Never thought about that. But God's word is the only thing that can make it right. God's word is the answer. It's a command. It's a promise. It's an intention for your life. It's how we are to live our lives. It's an honor that God has done this. It's a privilege to hear from God, to think that he would take time for us, to give us a promise, to show us what we're doing is wrong so that we could make it right. God went out of his way to benefit you. Pastor Messer from Trinity Baptist Church would say this every so often. The story of salvation is about a very, very rich man who, very became, very, who became a very, very poor man so that you could be a very, very rich man. God gave everything up for you to benefit you. And he's done it with his word. His word is the answer to every aspect of our lives. And again, as he's speaking, this is a rhetorical question, and it's funny, I always get a chuckle from you guys every time I say this, but it's the truth. When mom and dad speaks, and they're speaking to their kids with a rhetorical question, kids, you better not answer back. He's given you the answer of what he's saying in his word. It is his word is the only thing that can change the hearts of men. The heart of man is wicked. Why does his word penetrate to our hearts? Because our hearts are wicked. Our hearts are wicked. In Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? And I said, here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob, only God can change that wicked heart of yours. But again, people don't want to realize they have a wicked heart. Do you realize? And people are amazed of what people can do. Of the murderings. Kidnapping. Without the love of God in their hearts, man is capable of doing anything. And God blessed the programs of feeding people and wanted to shelter people. The only thing that can help someone is the word of God. The only thing that can change the heart of a man is God. From time to time, I, I tell you because it sticks out in my mind about a line 11. And Kristen was here and she told you about, if you were here, that you all sent people to Dearborn where Fawn and I went to church. The highest populated Arab population. And when 9-11 happened, there was celebration in the streets. And I tell you, I was livid. Mad. But I came to realize, without the love of God, people are capable of doing anything. And the only thing that's going to change anyone's heart is the word of God. Well, God's not calling me to do this, and he's not calling me. God's calling you to do something. And he wants all of us to be a leader. Wouldn't you want to be someone that leads someone to Christ? 
God wants you to be a leader. A young person. I never count out the young people. You can be a leader in your school. Be the one that speaks up and says, let's pray by the flagpole. Start a Bible study. I worked in the factory for 17 years, and most of you know that. And we started Bible studies. We didn't care what people thought. Be the one that speaks up for God. And too many times our young people are count off. But I'm telling you, young person, be the person in your class to be the leader, to be the one that leads people in prayer, to lead someone in Christ. Christ expects us all to be a leader. In Philippians chapter 2, I'll read verse 4, but the whole chapter of chapter 2, we are to be like Christ. In Philippians 2, 4, it says, Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. So what he's saying is it starts with you. A good leader thinks of others, not themselves. But we see here in this portion of scripture in Micah that the leaders were only looking out for themselves. They only care about themselves. I don't know if it's up here, but that's a good leader. And we'll get to a bad leader in just a moment. But a good leader is one that leads. But bad leaders is they lift themselves up. But look at the way they lift themselves up. They lift themselves up by using other people. That's the truth. That's a bad leader, and that's what leaders do today. They use others to lift themselves up. But as a Christian, we are to think of others first. That's what a leader does. You know what else a good leader does? And we learn this from Christ. Is to know the people that you lead. To have a personal relationship with those that you lead. That means that if you're in a home and mom, dad, you have children, you ought to know your children. You ought to at least know their names. That means you ought to know their birthdays. You all know what they're doing in school. A good leader has a personal relationship with those he leads. If you're a husband here, you're the leader of the home. That means you ought to have a personal relationship with your wife. That means, and I may get a few little elbows here and there, you all know your wife's and know about her. You all know what she likes and doesn't like. And when you take her somewhere, it should be somewhere that she knows and she likes. I ran into a problem when I was married because Fawn, God bless her heart, where do you want to go? And she says, I don't know. I fixed that real quick. Up north, there's a place called White Castle. So if she says she doesn't know, I say, okay, White Castle it is. And more, she makes a decision then. We well, see, I know that she doesn't like that place. <laughs> We're going to be married 21 years this year. Man, time goes by so fast. We heard from Joshua not too long ago on the phone. Sometimes I get choked up. but You know, we graduated not too long ago, and I tried to make the whole event about Fawn. And lo and behold, yesterday, the kids got me a gift. Man, I cried like a three-year-old. <laughs> that they actually took the time to think about others. But you see, the point of that is, mom, dad, when you think of your kids and you have a personal relationship with them and you think of others, and when you lead them in that direction your kids start thinking about other people. 
they start thinking about you. What a blessing. You raise your children and you think about them, you sacrifice for them, and you love and protect them, and you get to know them. Your kids want to know you. What a blessing. But you see, this was not happening. Here in Micah, it was going the other direction. The leaders were just thinking about themselves. And they start taking from the people that they were leading. How dare that? That's like mom and dad uh, gambling or something, and they go in the kid's room and break the piggy bank. They start robbing them. I hope you've never done that. But a good leader listens. A good leader obeys the word of God. Listens. And listen, I'm telling you, children, we should never count on our children. We should encourage them to be the one to lead something in their school, to do something. We always want to cop out and, why well, can't lead singing? I'm not asking you to lead singing. But you can at least lead someone in prayer. You can lead your family in prayer. Everybody can do that. Mom, Dad, we should lead our children to church. Lead them where to go when times are rough. We you finish this verse. And I said here, I pray you, O heads of Jacob, ye princes of the house of Israel, is it not for you to know judgment? You know what God is saying in a nutshell? And he's talking to the leaders. Do you really think you're not going to answer for the decisions that you made? My mom always had a saying, and I'm going to get this church to say it one day before I even say it. Payday, but not always on Friday. Even the leaders in our country, nobody's getting away with anything. I'm telling you this right now. Judgment is coming for all of us. Do you really think the decisions that you make, you're not going to answer for? Do you really think that you're not going to stand before me? You're going to stand before God. And this evening, I am telling you, all of us are still going to stand before God. We all have an appointment with judgment. And nothing can change that day. And when that day happens, what God does, we will not be able to change anything that he does on judgment day. Nothing. Do you really think that you can live the life that you're living and not answer for it? Christian, do you really think God doesn't know what you're doing? Do you think he knows, he really knows why you're not here? I say this often, I'm not the police officer of who comes to church and who doesn't. My job is just to preach in love. But God knows your hearts. In verse 2, who hate the good and love the evil, who pluck off their skin of them and the flesh off their bones, who hate the good and love the evil, I almost put a Dr. Evo picture up there this evening. I chose not to. But he's telling the leaders of Israel, you got to the point that you'd rather have enemies than friends. You'd rather be alone than have a relationship of other people. God wants us to be involved, to get to know people, to love people. It got to the point that these leaders hated people, but they didn't hate using them. They loved being by themselves. They didn't want to be bothered by other people. They'd rather have enemies than have friends. They chose misery over happiness. 
I forgot the study, and I don't want to put James on the spot, but there's a, a statistic out there about the average CEO being divorced. And I think at least two or three times, an average person that's a CEO is divorced. They'd rather choose business than family. And let me, don't, let me back up, though. There are some good CEOs. Don't get me wrong. There's always the good ones. But the average person chooses money over family, over having God in their life. And that's what these people got to the point of doing. They'd rather have enemies. They'd rather have God as their enemy and be misery. When people leave God out, that's what you're saying to God. I'd rather have you as my enemy. Believe me, you, you don't want God to be your enemy. You hate good and love the evil. You pluck off their skin of them and their flesh from their bones. You rob them of everything that they've had just so you could have pleasure. And usually that only happens and satisfies them only for a season. They're taking things from others. And when we got into this uh, last week, I think it was last week, that the leaders knowingly deceived people by being their friends just to rob them just so they could have what they have. Because what they had, they ruined. So they think they have somebody else's things, that would be okay. That's the average person. If they ruin what they have that God's blessed them with, and they start looking at what God has blessed someone else with, and, man, I'd like to have that. If only I had that. And you have something. And you chose to ruin it. But these leaders got to the point where they were robbing their own people just so they could have moments of pleasure. It's like today in some of our leadership robbing us of money so they could have some. And it's only going to satisfy them this for a moment. It's not going to make them happy. But they robbed them specifically the Bible says in the Greek that they robbed them of their blood, of who they are, their nourishment. They took away their substance for life. When I started studying this, I started to realize what has happened here. They took God out. God is the bloodline. He is the one that was nourishing them. And when the leaders decided to leave God out, they were starving their own people from God's word, from allowing God to work, for others to get nourishment from God. For example, this is like a parent that doesn't take their children to church. A parent that doesn't read to their children the word of God. They are robbing them of nourishment from God. They're robbing them. And to be blunt, that's what people are doing. When you are a parent and you have children and you don't take them to church, you don't open God's word, you are setting them up for disaster. You're not giving them a purpose for life. And that's what happened here. More or less, there was a spiritual robbing that they were doing. When you don't have God in your life, you are robbing yourself of a blessing. And therefore, if you're married, if you have children, if you have a home and you have not God in your life, you're not only robbing yourself, you're robbing others of what he can do in their life. And that's what was happening here who also eat the flesh of my people, flay their skin off them, and they break their bones, and they chop them to pieces in the pot and flesh without, within the cauldron. 
I've said this before, and it's in Scripture, even in the New Testament. One thing that really upsets God is when others mess with his children. Our kids are, man, 19 and 20 now. I don't care how old they are. You won't get mom and dad upset. Mess up our children. Joshua thought he had, had it hard and, uh, at home. That was a little hard on him. And that was at times. But he got to the point when he started getting to high school and he started laughing and chuckling and talking to Harmony. And I'm like, what are you laughing at? He goes, in a couple years, I'm out of here. Harmony, you got to deal with him. You got to bring a boy down to him. I'm going to tell the person that Harmony brings home that my daughter's not a play toy. Dads, you need to talk to those who date your children and let it be known. <laughs> I love our children. Vaughn loves our children. If someone takes advantage of them, you're going to try and take advantage of me. And this irritates God. God tells his children, vengeance is mine. Don't take vengeance out of somebody else. That's my vengeance. And I believe God can do a better job taking care of someone than I can. Then shall cry unto the Lord, but he will not hear them. He'll even hide his face from them at that time, and they have behaved themselves ill of their own doings. If you listen to what I said in the beginning of the sermon, God has a day planned for judgment. And when that happens, you cannot change his mind. For those that have rejected his son, and you meet him at judgment, God will judge you. And you cannot cry out to him and then make your decision. God's making it very clear in this verse. They made their own decisions. They did it to themselves. The judgment is here. And he's talking about the judgment here. And when it happens, you're not going to be able to cry. You're not going to be able to say anything that's going to change my plan of this judgment day. God has a judgment day planned for you and me. And when that day comes, we're not going to be able to make any excuses of why we did things or why we rejected his son. God will make things right. And you have to face it that you made your own decision. I don't know if it's said down here. It probably is. My mom is from West Virginia. But you made your bed, now lie in it. And you may say, I thought God hears people. He does. But on judgment day, that day's planned. You can't on that day decide now I'm going to ask for forgiveness when it's already happened. Some of you know the story about harmony. This reminds me. Harmony was at the age where she knew to clean her room. Three or four years old, she knew it. Dad told her to clean her room. You cannot watch this movie with us until you clean your room. Harmony stood in the hallway for at least 20 minutes, screaming. Dad ignored her. It wasn't that I didn't love her. She knew what dad said. And dad was not going to budge on what he told her. God does not budge on what he tells his people. He doesn't budge on his word. Lo and behold, you guys know the story. She finally cleaned up her mess and she came and watched TV with us. Simple as that. Instead of wasting all that time screaming and yelling, you could have done what was, was right and benefited from it. But here are the people done wrong. God's judging them. 
Now they want to, I'm sorry. It doesn't work that way. I'm here to tell you even this evening, and maybe those that are watching, God has a day planned. He has a judgment day planned for all of us. If you've accepted his son, well done, thou faithful servant. Come on in. Those who've rejected his son, that judgment is eternity without him. And this little portion of scripture reminds me of the people in hell. Wailing. Crying. Gnashing the teeth. And I'm here to tell you, God's not going to hear them. It's too late. And then God switches to those that are in leadership at the church. Thus saith the Lord, concerning the prophets that make your people err, that bite with their teeth and cry peace and have put it into, not into their mouths, that even prepare war against them. You haven't told them my message. You made up your own messages. You wanted the fame, you wanted the money, you wanted the entertainment, you wanted the people. But you didn't want my word. And by you teaching false things, you have led my people astray. And all they're doing is wandering. This is God's land. He's going to preserve it. And those who do not have his word are people who do not preserve his word. And God is going to get rid of those that have rejected his word. Because you see what's happening is now the people are lost. They have no shepherd. They're wandering around without the word of God. Without the word of God, there's no purpose. No purpose for your life. And when you get saved, you start to understand God has a plan. God has a purpose for each one of us. In verse 6 and 7, Therefore night shall be unto you, they shall not have a vision. And it shall be dark on you, and ye shall not uh, divine, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. You need God's word to light the pathway. Since they don't have God, they're wandering around in darkness. They don't know what path to go on because they chose not to have God. And now they don't even have a vision. As a pastor, I have a vision for this church. If I wasn't called by God, I wouldn't have a vision for this church. Do you understand as a mom, dad, young person, when you're saved, God gives you a vision. He has something for you to do. And that word vision, if you think about it, he wants to make it known. When I counsel people, I almost have it word for word what I have done, what I want to talk to them about. And almost everything is always the same. And when I have my first consultation, I don't make a second with them, one with them until they know what God's purpose is for their life. If they're not serious about it, I'm not serious about it. And I don't mean to be cold, but people need to understand that God has a purpose, and it's not for me to make it out for you, it's for yourself to understand what it is. And if you don't understand God's purpose in your life, there's something blocking it. And newsflash, it's not God. There's something obstructing your purpose if you don't know what it is. God makes it clear. That word that's blocking it is sin. If you don't know what your purpose is, if you don't know what God wants you to do, in his service, there's something wrong. Either you're not saved, or there's some kind of sin in your life that's blocking that vision from happening, that purpose. Then shall the seers be ashamed, 
and the diviners confound it. Yea, they shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. Again, this is judgment day. We need to understand in this context, in this portion of scripture, judgment is happening. And the reason why you hear this verse and you see this verse, there's no answer for God, is because there is already an answer. And the people chose not to do the answer that God gave them. And I'm here to tell you this evening, there's a day for you and I for this judgment. And when that judgment comes, will you be one that, yes, you've answered the word of God. You have received Christ. You have received his word. You are doing what God wants you to do. This evening, you may have been someone that has rejected him. And there's always one person that wants to find a loophole. The Bible says, and people don't want to read the next verse, but John 3, 16, John 3, 17 says, if you don't answer, you've already answered. You're condemned already. By you not choosing, you chose not to have him. This evening, judgment's coming. There is a day coming that God has planned. I don't know what that day is. But God has it planned already. God does not change his plans. Every one of us have an appointment with death. Every one of us has an appointment to stand in front of God. Will you be one that has answered? Yes, I have received the word of God. Or are you one that has rejected the word of God? All will stand. And those who are rejected, that day of judgment, you're not going to be able to talk. Every knee will bow, every tongue will confess his name. But you're not going to be able to give an excuse of why you did not accept his son. It's an old saying in our house, but it's true in our house. Some of the things we laugh at but it reminds me when the kids were growing up. There was a rule in the house. If dad got off the couch, someone was getting a spanking. It did not matter how many times you said, I was sorry. It didn't matter how you pled your case then. When it was time, it was time. God, our Father, has a day planned for each of us. There's a day of judgment coming. There's a day where we have to answer. There's a day. And I'm pausing because God has been so gracious. But there's a day coming that he will not answer you. There's a day coming, and that day is judgment. For those that rejected God, you will not, the day of judgment, you will not be able to say, I want to accept your son now. It's past. He won't hear you. You've heard the message. You've heard from God. Have you accepted his word this evening? Lord, we're so thankful that you even gave us your word. Lord, you have a planned day for judgment, but you also have a planned salvation. You sent your son to die for us, to wash the sin that we have. And Lord, for those who have accepted your son, those who have been washed in the blood, 
will spend eternity with you. But those who have rejected your word, your son, there's a day coming, a separation for all eternity without you. Lord, if someone is here and they've never received your word, may it be this evening. Lord, this ought to stir the hearts of Christians to get your word out. To maybe tell that loved one that doesn't know you about your son. Maybe this will wake up some parents to instruct their kids on your word. To teach scripture to them. Lord, to start leading them in prayer. Start leading in a way that those who they lead will understand who to go to in times of trouble, in times of salvation, in times of joy. Know who to turn to to understand who their, what their purpose is. Lord, I pray for the young people this evening. Give them the vision, give them the courage. There may be some young people here that are saved, that are Christians. Give them the courage to step out and talk to a, a cold class person. Let's pray. Start talking about others, about you, your son. Maybe just give the courage to those that are working the, at the workplace just to have a conversation with their coworker. Do you know where you're going when you die? Do you know Christ? Lord, may this church always have the vision that you have. May us always listen and heed to your instruction. Lord, as we go through the prayer list, I just pray that you be with each one in Christ's name. Amen.